And welcome to our second video for EDEL 414. I'm so happy you could join us. Um, today we are going to be looking at the next part of our textbook. And in this next part with your assigned readings, the emphasis is really on listening with love. So to get us started with that, I want to go ahead and have you think about what this means to you. Um, specifically, what is listening with love? Um, Chinese insights on the art of listening say that listening is made up of multiple things. A lot of times we think of just listening with maybe our ears, but um, the Chinese say that the ears are important, but also the mind, what we think about things as we're listening, our eyes, how we see or perceive things, our heart, how we feel things, and the most important, I think, that undivided attention to really focus in on what it is that we're hearing and seeing. So... In this week's video, I really want you to think about how you can be an artful listener using all five of these aspects to really think about and listen and engage in and feel um, the content that's going to be covered because this content is kind of setting the stage for the rest of where we're going throughout the semester. So on that end, let's go ahead and look at what the, the author talked about in her book and then we'll kind of build on this idea. So in our textbook, um, the author says that social comprehension is what we as educators should strive towards. And according to her definition, social comprehension is how we make meaning from and mediate our relationship in the world. So think about how we make meaning from and mediate our relationship. I think that's a very important um, concept to think about because each of us comes at things making meaning from our own background, our own experiences, and then how we mediate that relationship is kind of influenced by how we make meaning. So they go hand in hand. Um, our, another author that's really important is Geneva Gay, and she kind of is the one who developed this idea of culture responsive teaching. Um, she says that culture responsive teaching is defined as using the cultural characteristics, experiences, and perspectives of ethnically diverse students as conduits for teaching. So if you look at both definitions, what do you see as similarities and differences between the two? How is social comprehension maybe a subset of culture responsive teaching or how might culture responsive teaching overlap with social comprehension? Take a minute to think about that. When I look at it, I really see social comprehension as kind of what the individual student is coming and what their goal would be. And then culture responsive teaching is how we as teachers are going to kind of implement that into practice. So to get a better idea of kind of the similarities and differences between social comprehension and culture responsive teaching, I want you to look at this chart. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see social comprehension, and these are some of the key aspects the author identifies as being critical to social comprehension. And on the right-hand side of the chart, we see culture responsive teaching, and these are the key aspects the author says are important to culture responsive teaching. So when you look at these, again, kind of take a minute to skim through the bullets, look at them, and see what are similar to the differences you see among the two lists. Hopefully you saw by looking at these two lists that there are quite a bit of similarities between the two. It's really about in social comprehension, getting to know our students, allowing them places to um, define and understand who they are and building those relationships. Whereas in culture responsive teaching, I think it's how we take that information and then apply it into practice. So how do we use culture to kind of help influence teaching and learning within the classroom? Making sure that it's something that's not just a token type of thing, but something that actually is immersed and an integral part of our curriculum every day. So in order to get a better understanding of this idea of culture responsive teaching and what it looks like in the classroom, we're going to watch a quick video by a couple of key educators, including Geneva Gay, um, talk about this idea. And as you watch the video, please kind of think about what this would mean for you as a future teacher and how you might apply some of these tenets in your future professional practice.
I think people, when they use the term culturally responsive or culturally relevant pedagogy, forget that the base of the word is culture. So culture has to do with worldviews, beliefs, language. It has to do with values. Culture, to me, at its essence, are the things that uh, those filters that help us as, as human beings make sense out of the most ordinary things. Culture can be grouped into two different kind of categories. You can talk about visible culture and invisible culture, or tangible and intangible. The tangible, I would translate that to say the crafts, the music, the art, the technology. And those are important, but I think the more important are the uh, intangible. And these are values, beliefs, uh, feelings, opinions, perspectives, assumptions. So culturally relevant pedagogy, one of the primary premises is that teachers take students' everyday lived cultural experiences and make the appropriate linkages between what the students know and do and understand and come up with examples, comparisons, and contrasts. They make the connections. They are cultural translators. They are cultural bridge builders. I think when we talk about culturally responsive pedagogy, we have to remember that students approach learning not as cultural blank slates. So they bring into the classroom all of those cultural experiences. And so it is very compatible with what we know about good teaching. Culturally responsive pedagogy builds on students' prior knowledge. And in this case, we're talking about prior cultural knowledge, making connections between what is known and what is to be taught and understood. So part of the argument of cultural responsive teaching is the dilemma has been an incompatibility between the cultural filters that have been used to send instructional messages to students that's coming from the school frame of reference, and when kids from different ethnic backgrounds are trying to learn that, they are trying to receive what we send from school through another set of cultural filters. And if they don't match, then nothing's happening. So cultural responsive teaching then says is that rather than always insisting that the students adapt to the culture of the school, the school needs to adapt and modify some of its sending messages, its sending mechanism. When we think about what matters most about culture, I think the first thing to remember is that students are not mere representatives of a cultural or ethnic group. And first and foremost, there are individual students who have individual needs and interests, etc. Students who belong to an ethnic group, their attachment and bonds to the group vary, for example, in terms of how long they've been in this country, uh, social class, and their own experiences in the community and neighborhood. Because if we think about students' culture, we make culture a trait of that individual based on his or her membership in a particular community, conflating race and ethnicity with culture. We don't take race off the table at all, but we're really pulling apart what culture is and making sure we don't conflate it, because if we do, then we make cultural practices uh, a trait of that person's membership in that particular community. And that leads us, of course, to make very easily slip into one size fits all that my Latino children learn this way, or my African American children need X, right? And so it's making culture a trait of the individual that's been very problematic in the implementation of culturally relevant pedagogy. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video on culturally relevant pedagogy, and it kind of helped you figure out the intricacies and what it's all about in terms of implications for you as future teachers. So let's go ahead and come back to our video here. Um, and I just want to pose a couple of questions to you and have you think about what does it mean to be culture responsive in the classroom? One of your um, video response questions that you can select or video to chat questions, I guess, for this week 
would be what is the role of culturally responsive teaching in the classroom and how will you implement um, culturally responsive teaching in your future classroom? I think as future educators are willing to think about this, um, given the diversity of our classrooms today, given the not only cultural and linguistic diversity, but we have diversity when it comes to students' backgrounds for um, SES, for religion, for things like their gender identity. So all of these are going to play a role in how we become more responsive as future educators. So let's take off from this idea and we're going to look at our own identity once again and how that influences us. So as you can see here, this is my identity um, web as I shared with you in the first video. In my identity web, you see that I have specific things that kind of help identify who I am. Um, so I'm gonna pick out a couple of the terms. I'm gonna make an identity statement. And I want you to grab your own identity web, if you have it, or pull up the assignment, and go ahead and look at it as I do this and see what kind of identity statements you can make. For example, one of the things I would say, you can see the first pencil here, says wife. So my identity statement would be, I am a wife. Um, another one here is pointing to Hispanic. So another identity statement could be, I am Hispanic. So I want you to think about your identity web and what can you look at from your identity web and make a statement that says, I am, and then make your statement. Do that real quickly. All right, hopefully you had some good statements about yourself based on your identity web. I think it's important to identify who we are and what we believe about ourselves. And that's kind of what identity statements are as shared by our author in the textbook. By doing this, we affirm who we are and those key things about ourselves. And helping students do this is a very important thing to do as well. So they can make those connections and really affirm who they are. Once you help students do this, you help them kind of better understand the implications of bias and how bias can impact our identity. Um, so let's first just define bias. Um, bias grows throughout our lives based on where we were raised, how and by whom we were raised, our interactions with our friends, peers, and coworkers, our school, community, or religion, the media or news we watch or listen to, the politics we read or hear other people talk about, basically lots of different things that make up our identity. But all of these factors can influence the biases we hold and we have. For example, in my background, I was raised by um, Hispanic parents. My father's background was Spanish. My mother's was Mexican. Um, and coming from uh, this background, I would have thought that my parents would be pretty um, sensitive to bias, really aware of bias, but ironically, my father was probably one of the most biased people I could think about. He had nicknames for every culture, he had derogatory terms he would use, and it really kind of frustrated me because um, he would make these judgments without anything to really back them up or statements about groups. So as a educator, when I went into the classroom, I had to really guard against this concept of these automatic biases because I would have students in my classroom. I can remember one specifically a little African-American girl came in mid-year into my first grade classroom and she had kind of like all those markers. She had she came from a low SES background. Um, she was behind academically. I mean, she had all these factors or what you consider strikes maybe against her. And I had to hold back my um, bias and make assumptions about her based on these factors and rather just really work hard to get to know her and try and tap into the strengths and assets she did bring to the, to the classroom. And one of the things that's kind of unique about the student is she loved to draw. And one of the things she liked to draw most was Garfield. And I remember, you know, you would ask her to draw Garfield doing something or Garfield saying something. And she could draw Garfield, I think, better than the creator of Garfield. But when you tapped into that desire, that thing that she loved to do, you really got more out of her and got her excited about doing things versus making these judgments like, oh, she's not going to be able to do this or do that. So it's really about thinking how our own biases can influence us and how those biases can have an impact on us as well. 
Um, in our textbook, the author talks about there are two systems in the brain that kind of influence our bias. Um, system one is the part of the brain that is automatic. It's also the part of the brain where we make snap judgments. So this is kind of where like you might have been trained to you know, think about certain groups certain ways. So for example, if you saw an African-American male approaching you in the parking lot, you might cross to the other side and you know, walk across the street or something. It's that snap judgment we make where we have no idea who this person is, what their background is, but we still make these judgments. System two is where we focus on more logical thinking and connection concentration. It's the kind of thing we do at school on a long test, reading directions to assemble something. Um, or while we read and listen to new information to try to make sense of it. So it's really a more controlled processing of information and more conscious than that kind of snap reaction we have. So if you were trying to identify and um, be aware of your biases, which system do you think you would draw more from? Well, hopefully it'd be system two because that's where you're going to engage that logical thinking where you say, okay, I'm not going to make an assumption about this person because I don't know their background or where they're from. I'm not going to assume just because he's male, just because he's African-American, he's a danger to me. You want to really tap into that system two to have a better picture of who your students and people you encounter are. A lot of times, though, that's not really going to happen automatically. It's something that people... We're all socialized to this. We're all socialized to make judgments. We're all socialized to these biases. Um, so let me give you an example of that. There's a poem titled, um, Sure You Can Ask Me a Personal Question. This is by Diane Burns. Um, and just looking at the title, what can you infer from it? What kind of judgments can you make just based on the title? Okay, so if it's about asking a personal question, it might you might have inferred as something about that person and their background based on their appearance. And this is an actual picture of Diane Burns. So just looking at that picture, I think that might give you a little bit more information. But I want you to listen to this poem and kind of think about what kind of biases would the people asking the questions of her have? What kind of biases might they hold about her and her background? So let's go ahead and watch this poem and listen to it. How do you do? No, I'm not Chinese. No, not Spanish. No, I'm American Indy. Uh, Native American? No, not from India. No, not Apache. No, not Navajo. No, not Sioux. No, we are not extinct. Yes, Indian. Oh, so there's where you got those high cheekbones. Your great-grandmother, huh? An Indian princess, huh? Hair down to there. Let me guess. Cherokee? Oh, so you've had an Indian friend, that close. Oh, so you've had an Indian lover, that tight. Oh, so you've had an Indian servant, that much. Yeah, it was awful what you guys did to us. It's real decent of you to apologize. Well, I don't know where you can get peyote. No, I don't know where you can get Navajo rugs real cheap. No, I didn't make this. I bought it at Bloomingdale's. Thank you, I like your hair too. I don't know if anyone knows whether or not Cher is really Indian. No, I didn't make it rain tonight. Yeah, uh-huh. Spirituality? Yep, yeah, uh-huh. Spirituality, uh-huh. Mother Earth? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Spirituality. No, I didn't major in archery. Yeah, a lot of us drink too much. Some of us can't drink enough. This ain't no stoic look. This is my face. Okay, if you want... A copy of this video um, I'm sorry of the poem itself I do have a copy of that available for you so um, you can go ahead and read that it's in the week three course module but let's go ahead and kind of look at and think about this video so what kind of assumptions were they making about her well they made specific assumptions based on her look they you know all assumed she's a certain type of person from a certain background they made inferences about the culture itself, about, you know, the drinking, about some of the other assumptions you might hear from this about um, Native American groups. So all of these assumptions they're making were kind of biases. Um, another term for that would be a microaggression. Um, the ideas assigned to us are based on microaggressions. So in the poem that we just listened to, there were a lot of microaggressions or comments 
relating to Diane Byrne's identity that left lasting negative impressions on her, things that caused her to write this poem, because people, I'm sure, were consistently asking her these questions and making her feel, you know, lesser or a little bit frustrated that they were making these judgments about her. Other examples of microaggressions might be things like if um, someone looks at a Hispanic person, they may say, are you Mexican? Not every Latin person is from Mexico, so that's a microaggression. Um, if you have a, someone who speaks another language, like Spanish or Chinese or Arabic, um, and they're told in the elevator that they should only speak English, that's a microaggression. Um, specifically, that has happened in our own College of Education. We've had students who've been told um, by other uh, people in the College of Education, well, you should only be speaking English in, in the elevator. Well, that is a very strong microaggression against that group. They should be allowed to speak whatever language they're most comfortable speaking. I mean, academic settings and classrooms where they're required to respond in English, that's fine. But if they're out in the hallway or in the elevator, they should be allowed to speak whatever they want. Um, another microaggression that they can relate to socioeconomic status would be if someone says, is that from Walmart? You know, again, making the assumption about the class of a person based on the way they're dressed or the, the clothes that they're wearing. And then for gender identity, we hear a lot of, she's just going through a tomboy phase. Like if you have a child who is displaying more male characteristics and they have, um, they were supposedly supposed to be identified as female. So all of these things are examples of microaggressions. Microaggressions can have a very um, powerful impact on your students. So it's important to be aware of what these are and how you can address them in your future classroom. So I want you to think about your own microaggressions. What are things that have been said about you that can have an impact? Um, for example, I've gone back to my identity web, and I would encourage you all go to go back to your identity webs. And now think of terms that would kind of align to you, and that would be microaggressions. For example, I'll start over here. Um, one of the microaggressions I've heard a lot is... Um, in my own family, I was called Casper because I was the lightest of all the siblings. Um, we used to joke that my sister and brothers got all the Mexican brown skin and I got the white Spanish skin. So even in my own family, I had that little microaggression going on. When I was in elementary school, I lived in a very small town um, in rural Utah. So, you know, I get that microaggression of being small town. Um... As I shared, I believe with you guys in the first video, I'm a cancer survivor. So a lot of times though, I'm just seen as the cancer, not as the survivor of the cancer, not something that took me over. So a lot of times I think even like having had cancer can be like a microaggression if people just look at you that way. Um, sometimes I've been told I'm uncaring because maybe I'm not, according to people easily accessible, I don't share a lot of my background. Um, I'm not in the office 24-7. I don't know. I've been seen as uncaring, which again, I think is a very harsh microaggression, one that I really work hard to um, make sure I avoid because I feel like I am a very caring person. And then um, the two that are probably the most personal and most powerful to me are um, one that's the green card. Uh, my husband and I have been married for coming up on 26 years now, and um, when we first got engaged and we told all my family we were going to get married, my aunts and uncles and cousins all said that my husband would just marry me for the green card because he's from Mexico. So that was a big microaggression, something that really had a profound impact on me. It's kind of ironic now because all the people who said that, um, like my cousins in particular, the majority of them are divorced once or twice over by now, and I'm still married, so... Obviously, wasn't for the green card. And then the last and most powerful microaggression for me, I would say, is the um, biological mother. I am a mother to my daughter, but we adopted her. So I get a lot of times the microaggression, oh, well, you never experienced childbirth, or you don't really know what it's like to have your own child. Well, she is my child. Even though I didn't give birth to her, she's very much my child. So I am a mother in all aspects. So that is a microaggression that really kind of hurts me quite a bit. So I want you to take a minute now to think about some microaggressions you have. Go ahead and kind of jot those around your web. 
just kind of go through this exercise. If you need to pause the video here, pause it. But what are some microaggressions related to your identity that kind of have had an impact on you? Okay, so let's come back now. We're gonna take a closer look at these microaggressions. The one thing to note about microaggressions is that they can be intentionally malicious, but more often than not, they come from well-intentioned people who just don't really understand their own biases. Like a person might want to know more about something or someone um, to compliment them, but they don't realize their words can impact the receiver message. So like um, when people tell me, oh, you never, you know, you didn't have to go through labor, you're so lucky. Well, that kind of, that microaggression, even though they're trying to be well-intentioned, say, oh, that's, that's a good thing. It really is a kind of a hurtful thing. Um, so as a future teacher, I think it's important to teach students about microaggressions as soon as or before students you hear students using them. Because this awareness, helping students understand something they say or something they ask might have an impact on a student in a negative way is very critical. Um, one example I can think of is in elementary school classrooms. I've seen kids with um, different types of hair. Like you might have a, a kid with super straight, long brown hair. You might have a kid with curly, kinky black hair. You might have someone with bright red hair. Um, even kids who make comments about students' hair, it's like that can be a microaggression. So something as simple as that, something about their skin color, something about the clothes they wear, the way they act. So being aware of these microaggressions and helping students understand that we need to look beyond those, those factors and really be more welcoming and supportive of all groups. Um, I think one thing you can do to help you learn about microaggressions is to take a test um, called Project Implicit, um, or Implicit Test, sorry. These were tests developed by... Harvard, and if you want to learn about your own implicit biases and how they might lead to microaggressions, you can go to this website, click the I wish to proceed at the bottom of the screen, and then pick a couple of tests to take. You don't have to document your results, um, but if you do want to know more about your own implicit biases and how they might influence you, I definitely encourage you to take a look at these tests. Um, so to kind of wrap up this discussion of listening with love and really understanding more about our own backgrounds and our own biases, I want you now to go back to those microaggressions you paste, put on your web and come up with one to three statements that are now I am not statements. So my one of my examples would be I am not cancer. Um, I am not Casper. I am not rule. So I want you to go and now take possession of that microaggression and come up with an I am not statement. So do that at least one or two, one to three times. And actually write these down on your identity web. So you can feel like you're taking ownership of those microaggressions and you are declaring what you are not. All right, so to end this part of the video and get ready to move on to the next part, I just want you to kind of think about this one last quote from our author. She says, if we want our kids to truly respect one another, if we want them to listen to each other and actually hear what they are saying, we have to meet them where they are. Consider interactions from their perspectives and find teachable moments along the way. I think this is a really powerful quote because if we take a step back as educators and really look and listen and hear what our students are saying, meeting them from their cultural background perspectives, we're going to have a lot more success in the classroom. Um, that rural background I was telling you about, that getting to know students from where they are, this is a picture of me on the farm where we used to live in that rural area in Roosevelt, Utah. This is me. This is my youngest brother and then three of my cousins. So um, you could tell, very rural, very kind of conservative background there. But um, if people got to know that part of me, got to know how that part of my life influenced me, I think they would understand a lot more about me. 
just as I'm hoping to learn a lot more about you guys over the course of the semester and really hearing from your perspectives things that are important to you and that you can apply in your future classrooms. All right, so we're going to stop the week three content here. I want to go into our week four content. We're going to explore a little bit more in depth race and ethnicity. So to go into that, what I'd like you to do is look at week four, race and ethnicity. And as we move into this topic, I want you to really think about how you identify race and ethnicity, what your own race and ethnicity would be, and how this might influence you in your future classroom. Um, as we move into this, I kind of want to go back to talk about how we're transitioning now. We spent the first three weeks of content really focusing on this personal lens of our conceptual eye, getting to know who we are through our origin flip grids, our identity webs, our identity poems, um, and then also really looking at this active listening and how culturally responsive teaching can have a role in that. And now we're going to move, as we talk about race and ethnicity, into this kind of CRT educator lens and our systemic institutional lens. Um, systemic and institutionally is going to be led by your peers. We're going to post race and ethnicity articles for you to really think about and consider in that next, the race um, discussion board. And then educationally, we're going to look at some of the impacts of this in our own classrooms. How do we improve students' learning capacity? How do we provide teaching and learning that really applies to all students? And how do we um, build that resilience and academic mindset? Um, so we're going to actually go more in depth. And sorry, this does not match what was on the first video, but the idea is the same personal educator and systemic lens. So let's go ahead and um, move forward by looking one more time at microaggressions and how this might impact race and ethnicity discussions. As you're watching this video on microaggressions, really think about how they might impact people in general, um, but also students in your classroom, and then how microaggressions have impacted you. so pretty for a black girl. Oh, she has a Jew nose. Oh, your hair would look so good if it was straight. Jews are so cheap. Why are you so cheap? Do you speak um, good English? How are you an Iraqi Jew? I think the person saying microaggression kind of doesn't really think about it. This person who said it was my friend and like I was astonished that they would like say something like that. You don't want to make a big deal about it, but then it's also like you just said something that offended me, so I feel like I should speak up. Because they're micro, because they're um, very subtle, they, they're small, you feel like you don't have a reason to be upset. You're overreacting and people even can make you feel that way when you bring it up. They're like, oh, you can't take a joke. You're making too big of a deal of this. Why are you overreacting? Don't take it so seriously. It was just a joke. Chill out. You say like, oh no, I actually love black people. I love people of color. Like they try to just minimize the situation. If someone feels hurt by a microaggression, it shouldn't just be pushed to the side. It definitely has negative impacts and like leads to people disliking who they actually are. Those kinds of subtle offensive comments can build up over time and they can have like a deep psychological effect and you know they can make you feel bad and they can make you doubt yourself. We try to just use jokes to like make things less awkward or like ease social experiences but it is important because you need to like be aware of what you're just saying and like who you're speaking to. Think of what you say and how it can affect the person you're saying it to. Okay, so hopefully hearing from student voices kind of gives you another way to think about looking at microaggressions and the impact they can have. Um, I really like this because thinking about it from that student perspective, and like they said, they're really small, subtle things, but they can build up over time if they're continuing to be repeated. So as a future educator, I think it's really important to think about those microaggressions and how we can address them in the classroom. Again, remember these microaggressions come from the biases we might hold. We don't 
always mean to have these microaggressions. We don't always mean to say these, but it very much is influenced by the biases we might hold. So we're going to watch another video here, and I want you to think about the following questions. Um, what is implicit bias? How is it different from racism? How does implicit bias lead to, the discrimi to discrimination like racism? And what do implicit bias or racism, ha racism have to do with peanut butter and jelly? So let me go ahead and pull this up real quick. I don't know if that's going to work, so let me go back to this. Um, I just got to copy this real quick. Sorry, I should have had this up for you before. But again, as we're watching this little video, go ahead and think about the impact of implicit bias. That is not what I wanted. Hold on one second. Let me go back to this. Sorry. Okay. Well. Okay, let's try it this way. Okay, here we go. Okay, now I'm gonna figure out why my volume is not working. second. Okay, I guys, I appreciate you guys being patient with me. Let me go back one more time. I do not know why this is being so difficult, guys. Sorry about that. Okay, let's try this. It says it's plain, but we cannot hear it. Okay, here we go. What is implicit bias? Yeah, yeah, implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. 
I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm going to say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there's an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing. If you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's a scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. <clears throat>
Racism is to address it in positive and proactive ways, not push it aside, not feel like it's something like the students in the video at the very beginning of this part on race and ethnicity shared. If we don't address those little subtle microaggressions that happen every day, they're going to build up and have a negative impact on you. So I think we need to be responsive and address this as soon as we hear it in schools and among our students. Okay, so we're going to take one more look at why race matters and how to talk about it by looking at a TED Talk. As you watch this video, I want you to think about the four stages of ethnic identity development the presenter shares um, and think about how these apply to your own personal and professional life. So let's take a moment to watch our TED Talk. Thank you so much. When My name is Alex Kajitani, and when you have a last name like Kajitani, and you're a teacher, your students all just want to know one thing. Dude, can we just call you Mr. K? <laughs> no, you may not, I tell them. And when they ask why, I say it's because I'm really proud of my Japanese last name. And when you erase the last seven letters of Kajitani, you erase a really important part of who I am. And you know, it's become very hip lately to buy into the thinking that we are, we have erased race and are now living in a colorblind society that no longer needs to acknowledge race and ethnicity and that we all just get to be part of the human race. And today I stand before you to make the case that race matters and it's okay to talk about it. Now, for the past 10 years, I've been a teacher in schools with predominantly Latino student populations, and I've seen firsthand just how important issues of race are, especially to our students. Students like David, who came up to me one morning and said, oh, Mr. Kajitani, I'm so sorry. I didn't do my homework last night. I, I really apologize. I'll get it to you tomorrow, I promise. And I said, well, geez, David, what's going on? You know, you pretty much always have your homework. And he said, well, last night my uncle was working in the factory and the immigration service, or who our students call La Migra, La Migra came in and they grabbed my uncle and they put him on a bus and hauled him back to Mexico. So my aunt was over all last night and she was totally freaking out and she couldn't get a hold of him and I couldn't get my work done. I'm so sorry. I'll get my homework to you tomorrow, I swear. David's uncle was not here legally, or as the students say, he doesn't have papers. To students like David, race matters. When I was named California Teacher of the Year, I got a phone call from International Space Camp in Alabama, and they said, congratulations, we would like to send one of your students on an all-expenses-paid, full-ride scholarship to attend a week of space camp this summer. And when I told my class, oh, they were so excited. They were literally jumping up and down out of their chairs and squealing with excitement until one girl in the back of the class raised her hand and asked, yeah, if you're the student who gets selected, do you have to have papers? I said, yeah, I think so. You know, we got to buy you a plane ticket and all. Half my class, oh, their hopes and dreams of possibly attending space camp taken because of their family history. To our students, race matters. And what I've noticed is that our kids are actually really quite open to talking about issues of race and ethnicity when they're young. But it's actually us as adults who are often uncomfortable and unwilling to approach these topics. And what happens is our discomfort follows our students into high school and on to college, and eventually into the workplace, where they too become adults who are at risk of wanting to see race as something that should be eliminated from our collective consciousness. And we can turn that around. And we can create a society that embraces conversations about race to empower our children, to create confident college students, and to ignite more creativity in the workplace. And we can do it when we understand two things. First, how we form our own attitudes about ourselves, And second, when we understand what racism 
really is. Beverly Cross, a researcher at the University of Memphis, has done a lot of work around ethnic identity development. And she identified five stages that people go through when forming their own attitudes about their ethnicity. And when we're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about your affiliation with your race, country of origin, culture, language, and traditions. And so Dr. Cross identified five stages, and I studied these five stages for my master's degree. And now, as I go around the country and speak to audiences, I've simplified it to four stages to help people understand how they form their own ethnic identity. And the four stages are pre-encounter, encounter, immersion, and internalization. A person in the first stage pre-encounter hasn't really thought much about their own ethnicity or the ethnicity of others. In fact, they're pretty happy to just kind of go along with what everybody else is thinking. You might hear them say things like, oh, I don't believe there are any races, just the human race, or I'm colorblind. Now, I'm a big fan of comedian and talk show host Ellen DeGeneres, but I have to cringe a little bit when I hear her tell her audience of millions that she does not see race and thus reinforces a culture in the pre-encounter stage. And only when we begin to acknowledge that race and ethnicity are important factors can we move into the second stage, encounter. The encounter stage is not usually one that we usually choose to enter on our own. In fact, it's often the result of something painful happening, which forces us to acknowledge that race and racism exist in the world. Sometimes it happens when we see someone else as the target of racism. In my case, it was me and my father who were the target. When I was 10 years old, that's my dad over there on the left. That's Toshi. He's Japanese, and that makes me half Japanese. And when I was 10 years old, my dad took me to my first ever professional baseball game at Anaheim Stadium. And uh, after that game, I may have been the happiest 10-year-old in the entire world. And as we got back to our car, and we got into our car, and we left our parking space, my dad switched lanes, accidentally cutting off the driver in the lane next to us, almost causing an accident. And moments later, the driver of that car pulled up next to us and leaned out the window and shouted, you stupid Asian driver. They should never give any of you a license. Why don't you just go back to China? Now my dad, being who he is, leaned out the window and shouted, I'm from Japan! But me, I was devastated. And this was the event that thrust me into the encounter stage. And I knew in that moment that my race and ethnicity would be something that I would struggle with and think about for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, for the next few years, I became terribly embarrassed about being Japanese. And my four years in high school were actually spent avoiding the Asian American clubs. And I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. Actually, the only time that I f truly felt comfortable in my own skin was when we would go visit my Japanese grandparents' house for New Year's. And all my cousins were there. And they all looked like me. And it wasn't until I got to college when I began to acknowledge my own race and ethnicity. I was walking across the campus quad one day, and I was approached by a woman, I will admit, a very attractive woman, who asked me if I would consider joining the Asian American Coalition. And I was like, yes, I would. She, she said, follow me. I said, anywhere. And so she brought me to the booth that they were sponsoring, and I met some of the other members. And little did I know that I had just entered the immersion stage. In the immersion stage, we really begin to explore issues of our own ethnicity, and we start to want to surround ourselves with people and symbols that are just like us. And when I say symbols, I mean jewelry and clothing and music and events that convey messages of our own ethnicity. We also start to pursue opportunities to learn about our own history and culture, and we might begin to develop a large amount of pride in our own race and want to be around people just like us. Now, as I told you earlier, my dad, Toshi, is Japanese, but my mom, Lauren, is Jewish. And when they were pregnant with me, they were living in a small apartment in San Francisco next to a struggling unknown writer by the name of Alex Haley. Now, of course, Alex Haley would later go on to write one of the most well-read books of all time, or actually, I should say, the most well-watched books of all time, in Roots. 
And uh, when it, on the evening of June 15th, my mom turned to my dad and said, Toshi, the baby's coming. We've got to get to the hospital. And as they were rushing down the stairs, Alex Haley was just coming in, and he helped them to their car. And he said, I hope everything goes well. And as they were driving off, my mom turned to my dad and said, hey, if it's a boy, let's name him Alex. And my dad, knowing never to argue with a pregnant woman in labor, <laughs> said, OK. And people have been calling me Alex ever since. Now, this might be a pretty cool story, but it also means that I am a Jewish Japanese American named after an African American. And growing up in Southern California, I speak Spanish. So I'm all messed up. Talking about race and ethnicity becomes so much easier when you're just telling a story. If you're a parent, just jump in and tell your kids stories about your own childhood and make sure they know who they're named after. If you're an educator, tell your students about your favorite family traditions and sit back and listen in amazement as they happily and excitedly tell you about theirs. If you work in an office, go ask that coworker about the family photo behind their desk. Now, as I told you earlier, somebody in the immersion stage will usually want to surround themselves with people and, and symbols who are just like them. So my sophomore year of college, I decided that I was only going to date Japanese women. And I went to the University of Colorado, and there were a total of about five Japanese women there. And they all had boyfriends. No, seriously, that's what they told me. So, so I quickly had to expand and say that I would only date Asian women. And I know exactly what you're thinking. How did that Asian only thing work out for you? Well, here is a picture of my wife. <laughs> She's not Asian. I got to marry Megan because at some point after college, I entered the fourth and final stage of ethnic identity development, internalization. In the internalization stage, we start to become truly confident in who we are as a person and secure about issues of our own ethnicity. We start to uh, really see race and ethnicity as a very important part of life, but not necessarily the only part of life. We also become willing to establish relationships with people who are very similar and different from us, and we're not afraid to speak out against those who are being disrespectful toward others. Now, this doesn't mean that your search for meaning is over or that it's easy. In fact, for many of uh, my friends from Mexico or other Latin American cultures, or those from African American or Native American or Arab American cultures, that search is never over. And it's never easy. It's interesting because whenever I talk about these stages, somebody will always come up to me afterwards and say, oh my god, thank you so much. That's exactly what I went through. I just didn't realize I was going through it. And that's why the key to understanding why race matters is to understand the process that we go through when forming our own attitudes and awareness about our ethnicity. And the key to understanding how to talk about it is to know that talking about race and ethnicity is not racism, acting badly towards someone because of their race or ethnicity is. A while back, I walked into the teacher's lounge at school, and one of my colleagues was in there, and she was really distraught. She had been telling a story and, uh, to her class, and she had described one of her neighbors as a tall, friendly black man. Well, as soon as the words black man left her mouth, one of the students shouted out, that's racist. She said she got totally flustered, didn't know what to do, so she changed the subject and buried the conversation. Had she been able to say, hey, wait a minute, talking about race is not racism. Acting badly towards someone because of their race or ethnicity is. She could have moved the conversation forward and created in her classroom a culture where issues surrounding race and ethnicity were comfortable, valuable, and transformative. When I insist that my students refer to me by my full last name, 
I empower them to embrace their own last names, to say Mendoza or Malik or Kowalski with great pride. When we as adults are comfortable talking about race and ethnicity, then our students, our children, and our employees will be as well. Race matters. Let's talk about it. So says Mr. Kajitani, not Mr. K. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video. Got some good food for thought as you watched it. Um, I think Mr. Kajitani is really insightful in what he shares and the things he talks about when it comes to race particularly the four stages of ethnic identity development. So I hope you got some great information from that um, and thought about ways you could apply what he was sharing to your own personal and professional life. I know that for me, it's really important to challenge ourselves to have those uncomfortable conversations, to be comfortable being uncomfortable, as our author says, because that's the only way we're really going to get at any depth um, and meaning when it comes to discussions of race and ethnic identity. All right, so the last thing I want to do is make sure I turn over this presentation to the group that's going to be talking about, um, that's going to be doing their cultural strategies presentation. So in the um, discussion board is where I'm going to have the group post their voice thread link. So the race cultural strategies presentation, um, the link for that will be in the race discussion board. So after you've had your conversations and read your articles for this week, the group will be posting that next week. Let me give you the exact date to start watching for that race cultural strategies presentation. So for um, the group doing the cultural strategies presentation on race, they will post that on the 10th of February, so next Monday. And you can go ahead and watch that as you're watching their presentation. Reflect on the following questions and kind of think of what takeaways you can have. Specifically, what are three key insights you got from their cultural strategies presentation on race? What are two things you apply in your future professional practice based on what you learned from your peers? And what's one question you still have about race or ethnicity? In our next Zoom chat, we'll, which we'll be having the week that this video is posted, we'll kind of have a brief discussion about some of these things. So please enjoy and learn lots from your peers about race. Thank you for tuning in. And this is the end of our video two. Look to the video two chat room. Um, Look to the chat room for prompts for the video to chat. Um, those will be posted here in just a moment. And I look forward to hearing your responses. Take care, everyone. Keep up the good work. Bye.